Hey there lads and ladies, it is Petrifying Pumpkins here and today I am going to go off on a bit of a rant. This is just going to be, like I said, a rant, not going to edit it too much because I just don't have time. So let's just hop straight into it. This is going to be all about this article that popped up yesterday from Jason Schreier, who is a gaming journalist over at Bloomberg. He used to be a Kotaku. He got offered some fat stacks to go over to Bloomberg. Uh, but this fella is famous for being one of the most well-networked, well-connected. I don't know how he does it, but he's able to get all these insider scoops. He's nearly always correct. But I think people who work in the gaming industry see Jason Schreier as someone that they can approach and often anonymously, like he won't share their identity and they can, you know, complain, whistleblow basically to him and get their plight out into the public. And that's what's happened here in this article titled Sony's obsession with blockbusters is stirring unrest within the PlayStation empire. So first things first, I mean, I'm wearing, I'm wearing this PlayStation t-shirt here, but as you can see, I have inverted the symbolism, uh, much like turning a crucifix upside down because I hate PlayStation so much. No, I'm joking. I like PlayStation. What I'm going to do here is kind of take somewhat of a defensive stance against what I perceive to be a lot of, you know, blown out of proportion flack that PlayStation are catching. Not just because of this article, for a while now. I feel like anytime Xbox does something good, everyone turns their heads to PlayStation. They're like, why aren't you doing this? You're trash. You know, Game Pass exists. They've got 18 million subscribers. PlayStation Plus exists, has over 50 million subscribers or something like that, but you're not allowed to mention that. That's not something that gets brought up. It's like, no, you need to do what they're doing. You need to play games on their terms, even though on your terms you're doing very well, you're being very successful. As we speak, the PS5 is outselling both of the Xbox consoles combined. But that doesn't seem to be something that we're, not that we're not allowed to talk about it, but it's just not something that's coming up in the public discourse. From what I can see on Twitter and gaming websites and whatnot, there is a big, you know, oh, Xbox are doing great, Microsoft are doing great. PlayStation are making all the wrong moves, essentially. Meanwhile, Nintendo's over in the back releasing, you know, a port of Skyward Sword for full price and it's just got like an upscaled HD resolution or whatever, but nobody, you know, that's fine. We'll let that slide under the radar. Anyway, I've waffled a bit too much in the intro. Let me go into this article. I've highlighted some parts just for emphasis, but I'm going to go through the whole article. So, a lot of this article focuses on this small San Diego team who were made up of Sony Core's Visual Arts Service Group. So they're this small kind of support team that for many years have been helping out Sony's bigger teams, Naughty Dogs, Santa Monica's, whatever. They come in at the end of projects usually when they're needed and they help them with, I don't know, finishing off animations or polish or whatever needs to be done. They have never themselves made a game from scratch from the ground up, but that is something that they wanted to change. And basically this article is mainly about them and their story, but there is other stuff here to talk about as well. So, Sony Core's visual art service group has long been the unsung hero of many PlayStation hit video games. The San Diego-based operation helps finish off games designed at other studios with animation, art, or other content. But about three years ago, a handful of influential figures within the group, I'm not gonna say VA, whatever, over and over, I'm just gonna call them the group. They decided they wanted to have more creative control and lead game direction rather than being supporting actors on popular titles such as Spider-Man and Uncharted. So Michael Mumbauer, and I've locked him up over here. This is the guy. I believe this is him. Uh, he's only got a small amount of followers, which makes me suspicious that it might be a fake account or something. Uh, but maybe I guess they're just not well as well known as your Corey Barlogs and your uh, Neil Druckmanns. He took over the direction of this group in 2007, so he's been there for quite some time. He recruited a group of about 30 developers internally and from neighboring game studios to form a new development unit within Sony. So they wanted, he wanted to make his own group, his own studio, by pulling in developers from all these kind of surrounding studios, including his kind of sister studios from Sony. So their idea was to expand upon some of the company's most successful franchises and the team began working on a remake of the 2013 hit The Last of Us for the PlayStation 5. That's one thing, first of all, I mean, we'll get into it, I guess, but a remake for The Last of Us again came out in 2013, which I guess is like eight years ago now, is that correct? Seven years? Eight? So it has been a while, you know, but it's not something that anyone was asking for. So there's been a lot of pushback 
in the you know the discourse the public discourse the twitters the facebook's everywhere people are like why do we need a remake nobody needs a remake you know it has a remaster already in on playstation 4 and that plays perfectly fine blah 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 but there is like some strategic value because you know hbo are working on the last of us tv show which in all likelihood is going to be a hiss i would imagine it's been directed by the guy who did chernobyl which was like usually critically acclaimed and it's going to closely follow the story of the original game and everyone well not everyone but most people including myself love the story of the original game and its characters and all that kind of stuff so you put those two things together you would imagine you've got like a guaranteed hit in your hands so then you're going to expose the last of us to all this new audience who have never heard of the video game version of the last of us and then they will see oh there's a last of us game on ps5 let me buy a ps5 let me buy the last of us re remake and you know money essentially but sony never fully acknowledged the team's existence or gave them the funding and support needed to succeed in the highly competitive video game market according to the people involved and i guess that's an important point according to the people involved i mean you're hearing one side of a story here not that i'm saying that they're lying or anything like that i do believe them i do believe everything that's being told here more or less uh, but, you know, there's other things to consider. I'm sure we'll, as we'll get into us, we'll get into us. So the studio never even got its own name. Instead, Sony moved ownership of The Last of Us remake to its original creator, Naughty Dog, a Sony-owned studio behind many of the company's best-selling games and a HBO television series in development. I mean, just by reading that, all you like, there's an alarm bell. It's like, why, what are you doing, Sony? Why are you, like, allowing this team to exist, not allowing them to have their own name, not funding them, green lighting this remake but then stopping taking the remake off them and giving it to naughty dog you know so there's a lot of alarm bells going off there rightly so but like i said we'll read more so deflated the small group's leadership has largely disbanded according to interviews with eight people familiar with the operation many including mom bauer have left the company entirely so mom mom bauer declined to comment and others asked not to be named discussing private information a representative for Sony declined to comment or provide interviews. So the team's failure highlights the complex hierarchy of video game development and in particular, Sony's conservative approach to making games for the PlayStation 5. Now, the reason I've highlighted this is because I think it's kind of a contradiction to say this. If this group, this unnamed pool of developers were making a brand new IP or something a bit wacky, a bit wild, and then Sony were like, no, 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 give this to Naughty Dog instead. Then I would be like, okay, Sony are being a bit conservative here. However, this is a Last of Us remake. There is nothing very risky about, you know, allowing a Last of Us remake to be made, whether it's by Naughty Dog or by this team. You know, nobody would be like, wow, Sony are breaking new ground. Look how much creative freedom they're giving this team. You know, if, if they're coming along with a, a Last of Us remake. I mean, there's other evidence as well all around us. A few weeks ago, I was reading articles about how Sony were increasing investment with Media Molecule, the creator of Dreams, and there's nothing more risky than Dreams, I would say, under Sony's umbrella. And, of course, PlayStation Virtual Reality. That was a huge risk back in 2016. It's going to be a huge risk when the PSVR 2 comes out, and that's under Jim Ryan's leadership and Herman Hull's leadership. And they're going with that risk. I mean, that's if you want to be talking about conservative, look at the look at the consoles who aren't supporting virtual reality. That's conservative. The Japanese conglomerate owns about a dozen studios across the world, so that includes the likes of Sony Santa Monica, uh, Guerrilla Games, uh, Japan Studio, which has been you know recently chopped up. So that's another thing to talk about as well, I guess. Uh, but Team Asobi kind of survives over there. Uh, who else do they got? Sony Bend, the makers of Blood and Truth, but in recent years has prioritized games made by its most successful developers. Studios such as Santa Monica, Naughty Dog, and Guerrilla Games spend tens of millions of dollars to make games with the expectation that the, that the investments will pay off exponentially. And I've highlighted here, and they usually do. And the reason I've highlighted that is because, hey, the reason that they're doing these things is because it's working it's making them money they're making chris not only are these games commercially successful but most of the time they are wildly critically successful you compare the exclusives on playstation 4 to the exclusives on xbox one if you compare their metacritic scores you're going to see a lot of green on the playstation side and a lot of yellow on the xbox side you know and i would say myself that 
you know, the PlayStation 4's exclusives are probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest, reason that the PlayStation 4 did so well. And Microsoft has taken the opposite approach, relying on a wide array of studios to feed its Netflix-like subscription service, Xbox Game Pass, which allows users to pay a monthly fee for unlimited access to a variety of game. Sony's focus on exclusive blockbusters has come at the expense of niche teams and studios within the PlayStation organization, leading to high turnover and less choice for players. And this is why I've highlighted this part here, the less choice for players part. This is where I feel like it's the author, it's the journalist, it's Jason Schreier kind of injecting a little bit of, uh, mm, don't wanna say bias, it's not bias, his opinion, and that's fine because, you know, you're obviously entitled to put your opinion in whatever you create, but this is not something I would agree with whatsoever, you know? Okay, there's evidence, there's hard evidence out there. I have restreamed the last State of Play on this channel. I've restreamed the feckin' whatever two big events they had before that, and in the chat was full of people saying, oh no, another indie, another cutesy looking indie. Where's the real games? You know, everyone's saying, and when they say real games, they're talking about the AAA stuff. But we can all agree those games, those are those events, those showcases, whatever, they had a lot of experimental looking indie titles. Just because they were not from the first party studios does not mean Sony don't have that angle covered. There's that little Devils Inside game. There's, um, I mean, I could, sh I should have pulled up a list, but there's loads. Just rewatch those things, you will see they're full of indies, they're full of these kind of experimental looking things. Uh, what was that one that in the most recent state of play it was like the kung fu fighting one that looked really cool So as long as Sony are making deals with these second-party developers and third-party developers to make sure those games are on PS5 as well What does it matter that they're Sony's you know own in-house studios? Are focusing on blockbuster AAA titles and I say that known fully well that you know Sony London studios are not working on well they're you could call them triple A's but they're definitely experimental they've been doing virtual reality games for you know 10, I don't know, well, not 10 years, five years now, a bit more. What's more experimental than virtual reality development? You know, how many Microsoft Studios are working on virtual reality games? How many of Nintendo Studios are working on virtual reality games? How experimental are they being? How groundbreaking is it to release another Zelda? Oh, another Halo's on the way? Well, so yeah, I take umbrage. Not being fully aware of what the word umbrage means, but still probably understanding this enough to use it correctly in that sentence. I do take umbrage with less choice for players. I don't think there's less choice for players. I do agree that, you know, it has come at the expense of niche teams within Sony. So, so last week, Sony reorganized the development office in Japan. We're talking about it immediately, I guess, resulting in mass departures of people who worked on less well-known but acclaimed games such as Gravity Rush and Everybody's Golf. Now, Gravity Rush, Everybody's Golf, they have their fans, they have their audience, but those fans and that audience is tiny compared to anything else. So why would you pump millions into the development of these games when you can just make a deal with a second party studio or a third party studio and get them that way? I mean, obviously they're not the same games, but you know, for that type of thing. Uh, however, I still think it's sad to lose so much talent over at Sony Japan. I'm not saying Sony are perfect. I do think that's a worrying kind of sign that I think they should keep maybe at least Sony Japan making those kind of quirky games because as far as I know they do do well in Japan, maybe just not outside of Japan. But I would say console gaming in general is on the decline in Japan. So, you know, I'm sure they've got the numbers backing that stuff up. So the company informed developers that it no longer wants to produce smaller games that are only successful in Japan. So, I mean, that sounds bad when you listen to it like that. But I mean, if it's true, it's true. I mean, if Gravity Rush and Everybody's Golf were worldwide phenomenons, you know, there'd be sequels. There'd be continuing support for those studios, but they're not, they're probably flops. You know, I'm not sure they're, well, maybe they're making profit, maybe they're not, uh, I don't know, but obviously not enough for Sony to be interested. And at the end of the day, Sony's a business. A lot of retweeting going around lately of a speech given by Sean Layden, who was the uh, the head of PlayStation before Jim Ryan, and he was giving a speech about how, and he was saying how, okay, it didn't sell millions, but that wasn't the point. And like, everyone's pulling this out of nowhere now. But you know, I think it's pretty telling that nobody pulled that tweet up, or that speech up, I should say, before all this stuff. Where was that enthusiasm for Sean Layden? back when he was there, wasn't there, you know? This fixation on teams that churn out hits is creating unrest across Sony's portfolio of game studios. 
Oregon-based Sony Bend, best known for Days Gone, tried unsuccessfully to pitch a sequel that year according to people familiar with the proposal. Although the first game had been profitable, its development had been lengthy and critical reception was mixed. So a Days Gone 2 wasn't seen as a viable option. This is one that I do think I will agree with the majority of people who are like dogpiling on Sony. I've recently played Days Gone 1 for the first time and the reason I didn't play it until recently was because of the critical reception that it got. Uh, so a lot of people were very mixed on it and I do understand that back when it released there was a lot of technical issues. I think that the frame rate was pretty bad so I played it on PS5 at a mostly locked 60 frames per second i mean there was some frame drops now and again so i played it in its best possible you know version of itself but having said that i still thought the game was like surprisingly good i enjoyed it a lot the story somehow even though i looked at the trailers and the characters and they all looked like you know they were going to be cringy kind of bad boy biker dudes whatever but it was still very interesting and you know there was a big twist at the end and all that kind of stuff so i set up nicely for a sequel and I think a lot of people are going to be disappointed if that doesn't happen, which it looks like it's not going to happen unless there's a big enough, you know, kickback from this article that, you know, Sony will be like, okay, we'll make Days Gone 2. So I do think Sony should have seen that. They should have seen that, okay, critical reception was pretty bad, but they fixed some things, they improved this. We played it ourselves. We know it's a good game. We know the story is good. We know the shooting and all that kind of stuff was fine. The world was good. The hordes were very cool. So there was a lot there that Sony Ben did do well and I feel like they probably should have given them the benefit of whatever doubts they had and allowed them another chance. And if Days Gone 2 performed badly, critically, commercially, whatever, then say, okay, you had your chance. I feel like they didn't give them enough of a chance here. Especially when you consider that development for Days Gone 2, I know they said the development there was long, but with Days Gone 2, they'd, have, they'd already have the engine up and ready to go. Like, you know, when you already have a, a game to build off of, make a sequel of, I'm sure things would have went a lot quicker and smoother. Anyway, instead of Days Gone 2, one team at the studio was assigned to help Naughty Dog with a multiplayer game, which I'm assuming is the Factions mode that's going to be coming. I would imagine maybe as a standalone title now at this point, probably not going to be a free update for The Last of Us Part 2, but we'll have to wait and see. While a second group was assigned to work on a new Uncharted game with supervision from Naughty Dog, so some staff including top leads, were unhappy with this arrangement and left. Ben's developers feared they might be absorbed into Naughty Dog and the studio leadership asked to be taken off the Uncharted project. They got their wish last month and are now working on a new game of their own that will be part of a brand new franchise. I highlighted this part here. Some staff were unhappy and they left because I think that is reasonable for the staff members. I think that was... They were well with, within their rights to do that. So I don't think Sony were... Uh, made the right choice by asking them to do that but I kind of maybe wish they stuck around because it seems they got their wish last month and are now working on a new game of their own that will be part of a brand new franchise so that's not going to be Days Gone 2 uh, but I'm still excited because now I've played Days Gone 1 I know how good that studio is at making games and I know they've made Uncharted Golden Abyss on Visa which has its fans I've never got a Visa nobody did so yeah I'm, I'm excited to see what that's going to be so that's that's some positivity out of that situation it's just a shame that this these staff members here these leads had to leave I guess they were really committed to Days Gone they really wanted the sequel so they were unhappy with that, and that's understandable. Emphasizing big hits can also be counterproductive because sometimes games that start small can turn into massive successes. Sony didn't put much marketing muscle behind the quirky video game creation system Dreams by the PlayStation-owned Media Molecule in the UK. As a result, PlayStation may have missed out on its own version of Roblox. Now, Roblox, a game I've never seen advertised, I don't think. Uh, it's been around for a few years now. I know it's huge. It's this PC game. A lot of kids are into us. Uh, I think it's a huge kind of stretch by Jason Schreier to be like, hey, if Sony just advertised Dreams a bit more, they would have gone on to make, you know, $45 billion. You know, that's that's a stretch. I mean, just the fact that Dreams exists is proof that they're taking risks. Could they have advertised it more? Yes, they could have. Was Dreams in development hell for like 10 years? Yes, it was. Uh, so they could have cancelled that game. I think it had to restart development twice while it was in development. And Sony stuck with it. Now I know that was different leadership back then. And would that happen today under Jim Ryan? Maybe not. Herman Hulse probably would have been like, no. As I said earlier on, Sony have increased investment into uh, Media Molecule. So I don't really buy that part. 
that Jason Schreier is selling there. Mumbauer's project, codenamed T1X, was approved on a probationary basis, but Sony kept the team's existence a secret and refused to give them a budget to hire more people, leading many to wonder if the company was really committed to letting the team build a new studio. Still, the small team kept working, and by the spring of 2019, they had completed a section of the game designed to showcase how the rest would look and feel. At the same time, Sony was going through a management shuffle, and the new boss, Herman Hulst, was not impressed. So whatever they made up here in 2019, a little demo of The Last of Us Remake, Herman Hulst was not impressed with it. He thought the remake project was too expensive, according to people familiar with us, and asked why the planned budget for T1X was so much higher than remakes Sony had made in the past. So there's like reason in here for why they didn't just do it because they're evil. This group of people brought a demo to Herman Host, and he was like, this isn't impressive, you know? And you would imagine that's on them. Now I know they didn't have all the resources that they should have had to make a project like that, but not only was he not impressed, he was wondering why it was so expensive, and he can ask that question because he's had experience. Like, he can look at the list, okay, we read, we did the remake for Demon Souls, we did the remake for, you know, whatever else they did remakes for, I can't think off the top of my head. Why is this so much more expensive? That's a valid question, too. The reason, of course, is that they were putting a, grand, a brand new graphical engine into it, and they wanted to hire more people. You know, but Host wasn't convinced. And that, I wouldn't say that's... A rare thing to happen. I remember watching the documentary for the making of God of War, raising Kratos, and there's a part where, you know, Corey Barlog was saying, you know, Shuhei Yoshida was going to come in and check out God of War back when it was in early development, and this was before Herman Hulse, so Herman Hulse replaced Yoshida. So Yoshida was not happy with God of War when he saw it first in whatever state it was in, they never showed us, I don't think. But he wasn't impressed. But he, he did give them the opportunity to go again, but. That's because Sony Santa Monica are a big established studio. If it was this small group, maybe Yoshida would have cancelled it as well. Bit of food for thought there, I think. So just when it hoped to enter production on the remake of The Last of Us, Mumbauer's team got called in to help with another big game. So they went to help development on The Last of Us 2. Most of Mumbauer's team, along with some of the 200 or so other staff at the V, the group, was assigned to support Naughty Dog, slowing down progress on its own game. Then the roles got reversed. Sony sent word that after completion of The Last of Us Part 2, some people from Naughty Dog would help out with T1X. Mumbauer's team saw this as their short-lived autonomy being stripped. So this is a sign of conflict, you know. Mumbauer wasn't happy with these Naughty Dogs guy with their big dicks, swinging their big dicks around in his studio, and that caused conflict. So dozens of Naughty Dog staff were joining the project, and some had actually worked on the original Last of Us, giving them more ways in discussions about T1X's direction, which does make sense. I mean, you would go to the creators, hey, this is what we were doing, this is what we were going for, and maybe you guys can realize us on the PS5 when we couldn't. Whereas they were like, well, we thought you were trying to do this and that's what we want to show. So it makes sense that there would be conflict going on there or whatever, you know. But those who had wanted independence were disappointed. By the end of 2020, most of T1X's team's top staff have left, had left, including Mumbauer and the game's director, David Hall. Today, the T1X project remains in development at Naughty Dog with assistance from Sony's group. The future of the remainder of Mumbauer's team, which has come to be jokingly referred to as Naughty Dog South, remains unclear. So after reading all of that, which was quite lengthy, and I have to edit down a lot of that, I think, uh, but it reads like it's designed to get you to feel one way about it. You know, namely, be worried about what Sony's direction is going in now. The way this has been received has been, you know, oh, Sony don't take risks anymore. Uh, Sony don't support small studios within their own groups or whatever. Uh, however, nothing that Sony has done in this article has been, you know, with unwarranted. There's a reason behind everything. And all those reasons, even if they're all just financial, they, I mean, they make sense. At the end of the day, they're there to make money. Uh, doesn't mean we see less games like Puppeteer and Tokyo Jungle and stuff like that. Probably, you know, when they, they close down the Sony Japan studio and cut down their staff or whatever. But how many of you actually play those games? Uh, well, I'm, maybe you did because you're a PlayStation enthusiast or whatever. But in the grand scheme of things, nobody plays those games. The only thing in this article that does bother me about Sony is that they kind of show disrespect to Ben Studio, which I don't think 
you know, Ben Studio deserved that at all. I think they definitely deserved their shot at Days Gone 2 or whatever they want to do. Uh, but they wanted to do Days Gone 2 and they didn't get that shot. But yeah, for me, this is just the latest in a long line of Sony are doing this wrong, Sony are doing that wrong. They're doing PSVR, we won't talk about that. You know, they're doing great numbers with the PS5, we won't talk about that. They're doing, you know, 50 million subscribers on PS Plus, or maybe it's 40, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's a lot. It's a lot, and that's a subscription service too, but we don't talk about that. Instead, we'll talk about, you know, Xbox are buying up tons of studios, you know, that's fantastic. They're doing Game Pass, that's fantastic. Sony need to compete with all these things that Xbox are doing. We won't take into account that Xbox have like unlimited resources in terms of finances. It's this whole narrative that's been pushed lately that Sony are not taking creative risks. It just doesn't fly to me. I mean, this is a PlayStation virtual reality channel. This channel is dedicated to Sony's biggest risk in the last, since the Visa. The biggest risk since the Visa, you would say. And the Visa wasn't that much of a risk. PSP did well, so they had a good, a good foothold in the handheld market with the PSP, they just blew it with the Visa. So I would argue that PlayStation Virtual Reality is their biggest risk in the last 10 years, and I've built a channel around this, and you guys all love PSVR, if you're watching this, you probably do anyway. And they're continuing that, so only last month, two months ago, whatever it was, PSVR 2 got confirmed. So, you know, I just can't buy that. I'm looking at games like Destruction All-Stars as well. That's not a game Sony would typically make, but they pumped money into this and they got that at launch. Well, not launch, but launch window for PS5. Demon Souls, a remake, but a remake of a game that never really sold that well. You know, it was a very obscure game on PS3. A lot of people think, you know, the Souls game started with Dark Souls because nobody, like, not nobody, but a lot of people don't know about Demon Souls. So I would say that's kind of a risk as well. And then just this month coming out, at the end of this month, we have Returnal. So they're putting, you know, they're putting money into Housemark to make a AAA game, but this is their first time making a AAA game. Everything they've done before has been, you know, a much smaller scale. So that's a risk as well, especially selling that thing at 80 euro is definitely a risk. I don't think Returnal is going to do that well in terms of sales. I hope I'm wrong. But yeah, I'm not worried about Sony's, you know, direction. I think if they keep, if they stay this course, it's going, we're going to have a very similar generation to what we just had on PS4, and I had a great generation on PS4. A lot of great games. I look back on the PS4 and I remember the big blockbuster AAA games. I do not see big AAA blockbuster games as a bad thing, which some people seem to be pointing out. But when Sony do come along with the smaller indie stuff that they've teamed up with other developers for, I'm going to be happy to try that stuff out too. Especially a lot of that stuff ends up on PlayStation VR. You know, most of that stuff is not AAA, and you know that's most of the library there I've been enjoying. So a lot of what's been thrown at Sony lately just doesn't hold much weight to me. Uh, However, I've waffled on way too long about this. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. We can have a discussion about this if you want. If you want to call me a Sony fanboy or whatever. Uh, but I think I've backed up most of these points well enough. Anyway, let me end the video there. Let me thank my Patreon supporters whose names are on the screen as we speak. Thanks to their generosity for keeping this channel nice and moist. In particular, let me thank the following top tier Patreon supporters. Pete Hawkins, Tradition, Chopped 517, Crumb, Daniel the Pumpkin Patch Kid, and Columbus Thomas III. Thank you very much, lads, for that generosity. It really is appreciated. If you'd like to help on the Patreon, the link will be in the description below. But if not, like, comment, subscribe, all that usual shite will do just fine. Finally, let me thank Decepticon for letting me use his music in all of these videos. You can catch him in the description below as well. And with that, I will end this video. Thank you for watching, lads and ladies. Stay moist. <laughs>